Hello, welcome to Prescott Today show. My name is Harry Oberg, Mayor of Prescott. I have with me a representative Noel Campbell from District 1. Um, I think you also have a, a second person, uh, Dave Stringer is uh, another mm -hmm. representative, yes. and uh, Karen Fan is our senator. Our senator. Yes. That's right. Uh, I've been your state representative for three years, and I'm going on my fourth year now. And uh, it's been very interesting. <laughs> okay. Well, of course, we just finished up a legislative session. Uh, went from, what, mid-January right. to just about uh, mid-May or something right. like that. Uh, what were you able to get accomplished uh, during that time? What were some of the things yeah. that you were working on? Well, um, I was named the transportation chairman for the House. And so uh, the bills that I ran <clears throat> were transportation bills about trying to get more revenue into the system so that we can fix things like the I-17 so that we can widen Highway 69 you know, to, to three lanes and stop the bottlenecking. Um, unfortunately, um, any revenue bills have to go to, the, to be voted on in the, in, by the general public. And so the bills that I submitted to uh, raise revenue were basically never made it out of committee. And, and I think that is because of the desire of the leadership at the House and the governor not to want to have to raise taxes in the upcoming election year. But I felt it was important to sound the alarm about the conditions of our roads, our bridges, our infrastructure. And, and I did that. And of course, when you do that kind of thing, you take a lot of heat, but that's part of the job. You know, you don't make people happy when you talk about possibly raising the gasoline sales tax that hasn't been raised since 1991 and a dollar in tax in 91 is worth 47 cents today so we're not even keeping up with inflation and, and we suffer because of that. So as transportation chairman it's an important job and I look forward to doing that again next year maybe we can make some progress I hope so. Other bills that I ran, I ran a patient brokering bill that would have dealt with this this, this industry that is really shady these licensed outpatient treatment clinics that hire young people to go out and find them a person in distress through drugs or alcohol. And it really is a uh, terrible business because all they're trying to do is bring this young fellow into uh, a treatment clinic and get at their insurance or their cash the parents might have. No, with no concern at all that this person might not, might, might not only have a, a drug abuse problem, but he may have mental problems. And so you don't know what provider can provide what care to these individuals. And so it's just a, a business of going out and rounding them up and uh, getting at their money. I ran that bill. Um, it got held um, in, the com in the Judiciary Committee because of the penalty phase. Uh, the chairman felt that the penalties were, were too stiff. And I said, well, we'll amend that. We'll, we'll soften them. But um, he, he really didn't want the bill to go through. And so patient brokering uh, will have to wait till next year. I think it's an important issue. Uh, it causes uh, homeless problems, homelessness here in the city, because when they're through treating these young people and the money runs out, a lot of them stay. And I think people are able to see that um, increase in homelessness around uh, downtown Prescott. So, so you're, what you're trying to say is then once their uh, insurance runs out, they're released from the home and yes, they're of course, out on the street. Of course. And when there's no money, yeah. There's no interest, and this is yeah. a money-driven business. Now, we have good providers, Mayor, and you know that. And, and we have been able to make important progress in the structured sober living homes through the City of Prescott's ordinances, through the House bill that gave you the authority to do that. So we've made progress, and we're going to continue to keep on trying to do that because it's a quality of life issue for not only the residents that have to be surrounded by these individuals, but for the individuals themselves. And the whole purpose of it is to ensure a high standard of care. Right. We want to make sure that uh, if they are treated, they're getting the very best care they can for, for their parents' money or their insurance money. Unfortunately, in the past, that hasn't happened. So those were the things I worked on. But I do want to say a couple of things about what I was able to do, help do for the county. Um, we were able to get our lottery money back, $550,000 that the state was not giving Yavapai County. And this is lottery proceeds that, by law, we're, we're able to, to receive. And the reason we weren't getting it for the last few years is the legislature would sweep the money and wouldn't give it to us because we're a small rural county. And we didn't have the political clout to, to stand up and fight it. Well, this year, we decided, uh, Representative Stringer, myself, and, Represent and Senator Fan, that if we didn't get lottery money, we were no on the budget. And, and we found a couple of other rural legislators from um, Pinal County, uh, who are also not getting lottery money. 
And b between the six of us, we were able to say, if you don't give us this money for our counties, we're a no on the budget. And they couldn't pass a budget. So they said, oh, you want your lottery money. Okay, well, we'll give it to you. So they gave it to us. We also got our juvenile correction money back, 80% of it that we send to Phoenix to take care of our juvenile offenders. We have a brand new juvenile correction facility here, as you know, and we don't really need to send our young juvenile offenders down to Phoenix. And the, the cost to the county, it was over $680,000, but we were able to get 80% of that back. So that was a huge savings for the county. Plus, we were able to get $2.6 million uh, for rural schools to make them whole uh, with the, uh, I guess, the passage of Proposition 206 that raised the uh, minimum wage. And so we were able to get money for our schools to increase the, the money that they have to pay for the increase in the minimum wage. And we're going to get that again next year. And so those are the kind of things uh, we worked on. Also, I will say this, we got $30 million back for the HERF, our Highway Users Fund. Uh, I don't know, most uh, viewers will know that we we have $125 million taken out of the HERF fund every year that goes to fund the Department of Public Safety and goes into their general fund. And that is because the Highway Patrol doesn't have a permanent source of revenue. And so the HERF fund builds up rapidly out of gasoline and diesel tax and they take $124 million uh, out of there. By law, uh, the Department of Public Safety is only entitled to $20 million of the HERF fund and the uh, uh, state highway fund is only a, an additional 20 million. But that 40 million has morphed into 125 million. And so we're fighting that because they're taking our dollars for highways and road construction to fund uh, the pension, part of the pension liability for the uh, DPS officers. Uh, they have a huge uh, unfunded liability and uh, they have to pay their pension liability. So. Our HERF money goes into their general fund. They use that general fund to pay their, their liabilities. And we have the power in the legislature to stop that. We really do. But every year when the budget comes up, uh, there's a provision in the budget that says, notwithstanding the law, the current law dealing with the Department of Public Safety, we're going to ignore that and we're going to allow the HERF to, to give the $125 million to the uh, Department of Public Safety. So those are big things we're trying to work on that. We got to find a firm, permanent funding source for the Department of Public Safety. I introduced a bill that would have done that. It would have uh, increased revenue from a, from an insurance source uh, on when you uh, renewed your insurance. There would have been a fee added on, and uh, in an aggregate, all the people in the state would cover everybody that has insurance. Would have paid a small amount every year, and that would fund the Department of Public Safety, which would free up the money that we have in the HERF. Once again, that bill went nowhere. <laughs> so. You know, uh, believe me, I'm a conservative Republican, and the last thing I want to do is raise fees. But, you know, there's three essential things the government has to do. It has to provide public safety. It has to provide for education. And uh, public safety, education, and it has to provide for transportation. Those are essential things. Everything else you might consider to be accessory items. So we have to take care of the basics. That's what the purpose of government is. And so that's what I'm trying to work on. So uh, this next session... You're going to bring up the patient brokering bill Yes, again. I'll bring that bill up again. I uh, hope to get some allies over in the Senate side, uh, possibly Senator Bartow. I still have to run the roadblock of uh, Senator uh, Representative Farnsworth, who chairs the Judiciary Committee. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to deal with uh, that individual. I don't know why he doesn't like the bill, but we'll, I'll, I'll try to figure that out. But I'm definitely going to reintroduce that bill again. And where you got these funding streams... Uh, uh, brought back to the county. Do you think you'll have to fight for that every year? Absolutely. Okay. Every year. I mean, uh, uh, these are one-time payments that we're getting uh, out, out of the budget, and if we don't fight for them, they'll they'll take our lottery money and use it for something else. And uh, but we've we've figuring this out pretty rapidly. That it only takes five Republicans to say no, and then there can be no budget. It just can't happen. So I have to find five like-minded representatives in the House, and, and we should be able to do that, and we can get the things for our county. They didn't send me down there to represent Maricopa County. They uh, hopefully sent me down here to represent um, my district, which includes Yavapai County and Anthem, which is actually kind of like Phoenix in a sense. But uh, yeah, and we're gonna try to you know, show some progress. Uh, we didn't do it the first two years I was there. We got it done the third year, and we're gonna get it done the fourth year. Okay, and uh, after the session, um I think uh, 
Speaker of the House, J.D. Mesnard, decided mm -hmm. to set up an ad hoc committee mm -hmm. and uh, put you and uh, Dave Stringer on it. So right. Would you like to talk about that for a minute? I, I would, Mayor, because this isn't something that Representative Stringer and I really asked for because it's such a contentious issue. When you talk about pension reform, uh, that pits you up against the police and firefighters unions. And you know, police and firefighter, it's like motherhood and apple pie. You don't want to take the, take this issue on and offend these individuals because they take care of us. And and, and so it's, it's kind of a no-win situation. But what's happening is, is that the liability for these pensions is so great. Uh, we owe about $8 billion in pension liability all over the state. Uh, Prescott uh, owes about, I think, $82 million in their pension liability. That is causing a great um, consternation among cities, counties, and fire districts on how they can pay these liabilities. And as you know, the city of Prescott's uh, uh, put forward Proposition 443 to increase the state sales tax by 0.75%. That's a 40% increase in the state sales tax uh, for this city, and that's that's a, that's a not a small amount. And because of all of this, we're sitting at the epicenter, as you know, of the pension problem. And because of that, the city council has constantly said, "Look, this is not a, a problem of our causing. It is created by the state. Uh, the state is responsible. The state should solve the problem." And there is truth to that. The state did create portions of the statutes that, that allowed overly generous benefits to members, such as the Permanent Benefit Index, or the COLA. A 4% COLA compounded every year. Uh, the uh, DROP program that allows an officer to retire on paper and continue working at his highest salary where it, when he does not contribute any more of that salary to the pension liability fund. And at the end of five years, he takes out five years uh, lump sum payment of what that his retirement would have been. So that drains the fund. I mean, uh, it, it stops younger officers from being hired who would contribute and be at a lower salary rate. So a lot of, lot of blame going around. Cities allowed their firefighters and police to retire with disability at very high rates. For example, the city of Bisbee has 30% of its police and fire on disability. Uh, the average in the state's 15%, and that's probably too high. And these, these things were allowed because when you go on disability, you start drawing money from your pension and you quit paying in. And if you're on the job five or seven years and you get injured and you're, and you're allowed to draw disability, uh, that can have serious impacts on the fund, and it does. So with all of this said and done, the speaker uh, decided uh, that uh, he would give Representative Stringer and myself this ad hoc committee just to educate the public, look into possible solutions for PSPRS, and, and go from there. And, and he did that because of the grand swell. For, for example, like people like you get, talking to the mayors all over the state about this problem, writing a letter to the governor saying, we need help here. And now this issue is gaining traction. It is really gaining traction. We have uh, one representative who's willing to offer a very tough solution, which is to amend the Constitution to take out that constitutional protection that police and fire have over their pensions. Representative Livingston said he would uh, introduce a bill to do that. The Arizona Senate President uh, Steve Yarborough has said that uh, he, it's time to revisit this constitutional provision uh, that protects uh, and can never reduce or diminish uh, these retirements because the state is now being mandated to come up with $45 million a year annually to pay for the um, elected officer's pension retirement fund. and so. Mm -hmm. We don't have $45 million laying around. Our budget's balanced, you know. We might have a small surplus, and we put that into the rainy day fund. So where, where's the state going to get this money? And okay. what this is doing is causing the legislatures to become aware of the problem. Okay, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes uh, to talk more about PSPRS with uh, Representative Noel Campbell. Welcome back to Prescott Today. My name is Harry Oberg, Mayor Prescott, and I have with me uh, Representative Noel Campbell, who's uh, our representative from the first district here in, in Arizona. Uh, we just were talking about uh, this last legislative season, uh, some of the things that he tried to get done and what he's going to look forward to in the, in the next session that starts in January. But he's also been assigned as the chairman of uh, an ad hoc committee that's looking into PSPRS. And, uh, 
you've already had a couple of meetings, uh, one mm -hmm. in Flagstaff, uh, right. one down in Bisbee. Um, we're looking forward to some others around the state. Right. Uh, what are some of the things you're finding out when you talk to these cities? Well, we're finding out how distressed they are. For example, the city of Bisbee has a pension liability of uh, $17 million, and they are only able to fund 5% of their liability, which means for every dollar of pension liability that they owe, they only have a nickel. That's not sustainable. They can't continue to make these payments. And so the state stepped in and said, uh, you're, you're in a 20-year window here to make these payments, and they extended it to 30 years. So the city of Bisbee opted to go into the 30-year payment schedule, which lowered their their monthly payments, but there is a cost to that at the end. Their, their liability has increased by probably several million dollars by doing that. So the, the same with Flagstaff. Flagstaff is uh, funded under 50%. The same with uh, Prescott, where we're uh, funded under 50%. A normally healthy pension fund would be at 85% plus. At one time in the state of Arizona, 19, in 2001, we were funded at over 112%, which means we had more money in the system to cover all the projected liabilities. But through bad investments, um, you know, downturn. the downturn in the economy, our fund went, went belly up. And now we're facing it, and the cities and counties and fire districts are facing this issue of how to make their payments. And you, Mayor Oberg, know better than most uh, how much you have to pay out each year. And so this committee was given to us to look at these issues and educate the public. I mean, especially here in Prescott, the public is educated because they're asking, being asked to raise their taxes 40% on sales tax. That could have serious implications on business activity. Uh, and I'll give you an example, and, and then I'll tell you why I support 443. But let's say you want to buy a big ticket item like a car or a motor home, and you can save four or $500 by going someplace other than Prescott, you might be inclined to do that. Okay, because we got plenty of auto dealers in Prescott Valley and Clarkdale and, and down in Phoenix. So this tax thing is a very contentious issue. And the, uh, the feeling is, is that uh, on one point of view is that it's kind of like pouring money down a rat hole. It's not going to cure anything. And why throw good money after bad? The other argument is it gives the city time to figure this out and to make their payments and hope that the legislature comes to the rescue. My position on 443 is this. I support 443 with this caveat, and this is really bothers me because it's not being announced uh, why I support 443. I support 443 only if the total tax revenue plus the city's current payment plus money from the reserve fund is all applied at once. That will lower the pension liability. And that's what the voters and the taxpayers expect. They expect us to lower the liability. And by just putting tax money only, that will not lower the pension liability. And the, the ballot initiative only says that the money from the tax revenue will be directed at pension liability. It says nothing about lowering pension liability. And the, the powers that be in the city, some of them are saying that the tax will lower the pension liability. I don't believe that's true. And we need to not only put the full tax, plus our current payment, plus any other money. The more money we can put up front into this pension liability debt, the better it is for the city. And that's my position. And so those people that use my name to say I support 443, you're leaving out an important message here. I support 443 only if the city makes a sacrifice to pay its current payments of seven and a half million plus maybe money out of the city's rainy day or reserve fund to lower the liability. If you're not going to do that, you're being disingenuous with the voters. Okay, uh, also, um, I think one of the things that you heard when you were definitely in, in Bisbee, and I know that uh, some of the mayors around here have indicated it, that first of all, if you're making your payment, then therefore the, the legislature doesn't view that as a problem. Well, that's absolutely right. <laughs> and so the other thing is they say that you know, the legislature doesn't realize what they're really having to do to try and make these payments That's and how right. much they've got exactly. staff, uh, yeah. how much they've got services. Um, and I think it's Im important to, to look at. Right. Um, I think it was uh, Tucson indicated that uh, they were down about 180 or almost 200 uh, police officers. Right. Because they can't afford That's to, right. to bring. Tucson bring is $800 million in, in liability. Right. Uh, to their pension fund. That's that's a pretty stiff amount right. uh, even for a city like Tucson. 
Um, getting back to your original question about the legislature, yeah, as long as you make your payments, the legislature says, hey, we don't have a problem. You're making your payments. And I use this analogy. You buy a car off the lot and you finance it through the bank and the car turns out to be a lemon. You got problems with this car and you're complaining to the bank about your car. Do you think the bank cares as long as you're making your payments about your car? They don't care at all. The bank's only going to care when you stop making your payments. Okay, and that's the truth. So right now, the legislature is totally devoid of any interest in this because there is no problem. Everybody's making their payments. It's only when crisis comes that the legislature pays any attention. And now the crisis is, we're, we're all on the beach enjoying the, the ocean and all the animals are running inland uphill. And we're sitting there scratching our heads saying, well, what's going on here? Well, there's a tsunami coming and we're too ignorant to really understand what's happening. So it's coming and when it, when it happens, the legislature will get very involved. But then, you know what? The longer we wait, the harder it's going to be to solve the problem. And I think the other thing, too, is and you brought it up with the, uh, the HERF. Uh, I know the um, county administrator from Cochise County indicated that because the HERF money is being swept for DPS, right. and they're not getting what the money that they would normally get, get for, roads and for, for roads in the county, they're having to take money out of their general fund, right. which reduces their ability right. to make you know additional payments right. into the PSPRS and try and lower right. their unfunded liability. But I think the other thing that uh, you know I think a lot of people are concerned about is that there's decisions made at the legislature that they really don't understand right. how much they're affecting the city. Absolutely. And one of the, you know the two that have been uh, brought up for the last couple of years that I'm aware of is the construction sales tax mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the sales tax on rentals right. and uh, just about every year there's a bill brought forward to try and eliminate that and I know for Prescott by itself uh, that's almost two million dollars right uh, that we would lose right and if we lost that funding stream and if we have a downturn right you know I know in the last downturn in uh, 08 uh, we lost about four million dollars right. a year in tax receipts so well, well I'm happy to tell you that I voted against that because I hear you I mean you know you can call me up direct straight pipe into me. I'm not down there to represent Maricopa County. I'm, uh, I'm concerned about our county and our, our situation here. So yeah, there's uh, uh, things that we can do and we do do, and we try to protect our cities. Uh, you know, there was this uh, big contentious issue about uh, Airbnb coming into re residential neighborhoods. And, and the benefit of that was that the tax was automatically collected and given to the city when many people were renting out their property and paying no tax. But the downside was you're having residential property, uh, having uh, uh, strangers in the houses and for maybe you know for a week at a time. So that was a very difficult issue. Uh, on that particular case, I voted with the residents, but it didn't happen. The bill passed, and the, down, the upside is, is that the city is getting regular revenue by a reputable company that rents out these properties. Uh, but it was a big issue down there. And the, another thing is uh, we recently attended a mayor summit that I, right. I um, put together. It was the third one. And uh, two things came out of that that really concerned me. And the first of all is uh, I guess the PSPRS board right now uh, is going to revise the mortality tables. Right. And they're going to go to, a, I guess, maybe a, a national level right uh, where they've suppressed that yes. that age in the past so mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a significant increase this, this coming year um, that we're going to see in our unfunded liability that's going to make the that. unfunded liability even greater yeah and and also they only made 0.63 in, right. in 2016 and of course we won't see that until this November right see exactly what that effect right. is but obviously when they don't make the expected rate of return that adds to our unfunded liability. I, uh, I'll use another little analogy here. I'm kind of big on that. <laughs> it's like a coach of a football team has lost nine games in a row telling us how great they're going to be the next game. <laughs> you know, you kind of scratch your head there. You're 0-9 and, and, and you're, you're in great shape. I mean, it, it just it's, doesn't make any sense. PSPRS is in real trouble. And, I don't, and I'm one of those that don't know if that gap can be closed. I hope it could be. But, but the overall fund is like at 46%. I mean, you know, and we're starting now to get people aware of this. People at the Capitol, they know something's happening. And um, that's, that's the reason that they were give, gave us this committee. And even our committee is causing them consternation because 
there are powers down there that, that want to keep a lid on this. Uh, police and firefighters unions, you know, they have their vested interest with their membership, and I, and I appreciate that. But when people start talking about how bad the fund is performing, then they want to start talking about solutions. And th this is the real crux. What are solutions? What could happen? Um, and l there's only one, two, two ways that the fund gets money. You get it through employer contributions and employee contributions and investment return. That's the only way that fund can get money. And when the investment returns do poorly, the fund and the liability, the gap widens. So what could the state do? Well, do you think the state of Arizona would raise its state sales tax to pour money into PSPRS? That would be a solution. But boy, you're talking about real gut check time. Um, I don't know. It depends how bad it is, how good, good leadership we get. Uh, I know through your efforts of educating the other mayors that the, at the lower level, the, the mayors and the officials at that level are being well educated to their problems. It hasn't occurred yet up at the legislature and the governor's office. They really got to get involved in this and get on top of it. Uh, and, I, and I look at myself and Representative Stringer as Paul Revere. We're sounding the alarm. I mean, you can listen or not listen. You can put your head in the sand. You can do whatever you want. But we're sounding the alarm to this problem that's going to affect this whole state. And the other thing is, um, you know, I think it was 10 years ago or so, um, the PSPRS indicated they were going to get 8% 8, 8 returns, and then right. they've been dropping it. They're right. now, uh, I think, in uh, uh, 17, they were 7.5. That's down to 7.4. We're going into FY18, so now they're uh, down to 7.4. And they were looking at dropping it down to 7.3. Right. But again, that would add more, more to the unfunded liability. Yes, so it does. They eventually want to get down to 7.0, right. being a little bit more realistic. Really, yes. But if you look at the last 10 years, I think their uh, average rate of return over those 10 years is 4.5. Right. So they're well under their expected right. rate of return. And every time they don't make that, that, that adds to the uh, employer's you know. uh, cost. The other thing, of course, a lot of people don't realize is that the employee is capped. Um, that's right. Depending on which tier you're in. Yeah, that's right. If you're in tier one, the most you have to, you'll be uh, obligated to pay in is 7.65. Right. And 11.65 for a tier two. Right. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's um, obvious that, you know, we're, we've, we've got a long ways to go to right. try and get this thing corrected. And, uh, you know, I very much appreciate uh, um, J.D. Mesner stepping up and, and establishing this ad hoc committee. Uh, I know that in, in many cases what you're going to be doing is while I'm trying to maybe educate the mayors, you're going to be trying to educate right. the, uh, the legislator. And I think we made good progress on the last mayor's meeting. It was a bombshell revelation when Representative Livingsworth said he would, he would run the bill to amend the Constitution. I mean, that is kind of like the nuclear option here. Uh, to do that. Uh, it, it's something I've thought about, but it's such a, it's such a, coming up such a brick wall. Uh, but he, he, he offered to do that. So now uh, he has to garner support from the League of Cities and Towns. He's got to get the backing of the mayors and the county supervisors to do this. And then my hope is that we can, we could bring this bill to the floor of the house and have our members vote on it. Members have to stand up and be counted on this issue. The, but I will say this, the firefighters and police unions are so strong, the last time an issue came up that affected firefighters and police officers, 56 out of 60 members of the House voted with the fire and police unions, okay? That's how strong they are. And anybody who thinks that they're not strong really doesn't understand the true strength that they, they have. Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, you got a lot of work to do, and uh, <laughs> I want to thank you for coming in today. and. Uh, helping the uh, viewing audience understand this and uh, look forward to maybe having you come back at another time and we can talk about uh, whatever progress you've been able to make. Thank you very much, Mayor. Appreciate so thank it. Thank you and uh, thank you everybody for watching and uh, we'll be back next month. Thank you.